Okay, back on our sarcasm tour, satire tour of Revelation 17. And I fixed the error that I caught while I was making my last increment. I had mistakenly placed Marcus Aurelius's death in the wrong place. He dies, this, this is part of the wit, and, and it's a repeated pattern. Mark had started the same thing. I haven't done the videos on that to show you, but I will. Um, there is a repeated pattern of using Kai to designate the crowning or the death of an emperor or a king. Now, the reason that matters so much is that in Latin, the actual term is Kaiser. So when it's truncated, that's a snub. That's like saying something bad. Like, oh, you think you're a king, huh? Well, you're just a Kai. You're just a connector in history. Remember, this is God talking, and the whole purpose of this thing, in Revelation 17 in particular, is to show how the kings of the world are nothing compared to God. And any king who gets his crown gets it from God, and if he misuses it, he gets, you know, burlesqued by God. When we saw Trajan, the gossip about Trajan, as if that was the only thing worth remembering, but that proves God's omniscience, okay? What Trajan supposedly said that only his wife heard, that his wife claims he said, and the Senate really disputed that with her. They thought that she was the lover of Hadrian. And then not only just that one word, but duro means come here. And in 118, that's exactly what was said to Hadrian, who happened to be at that time in 117, August of 117 AD. Hadrian was still in Syria trying to put down the rebellions of the Jews. Okay, because that was still sort of like the Kitos War, that was a closing part of the Kitos War, which had started in Karanaka, I cannot say it right, modern Libya, and sort of spread all over the underbelly of Rome, and so they were really interested in putting it down. And so Hadrian was in Syria at the time that Trajan died to put it down. Now, in order to play this wit of what he, what Trajan said in his dying moments to his own wife, to use Legon like that is really pretty biting, don't you think? But it shows omniscience. And one of the purposes of a Bible book is to show that God is the one that's behind it. So if people were remembering to count the meter like they should have done, <clears throat> by the time they got to Legon, and they hear the gossip about what Trajan was saying about who's his successor, they're going to smile and know, okay, you know, because at this point, Revelation would have been out for like 20 years. It was still relatively new, 30 years, 88 AD to 117, 29 years. Okay, it had been out. So to hear Legon <clears throat> said at the very point where Trajan dies, and then to see Duro, Knowing that that's what happened to Hadrian, he was ordered to come here, that's what Duro means, is really pretty uh, astonishing and satirical and biting. Okay, and, but it doesn't stop there. That's just the first one. See, that's the first pun that I know of. There might be other puns here, but I don't know of them. Okay, and then the second one, it's better than I thought, is here. 91 plus 88 means 179 A.D. Okay, in 179 A.D., Marcus Aurelius was still emperor. He had a son named Commodus. And in 177 A.D., he had made his son co-Augustus. He made Commodus an, a co-emperor at age five. So everything you see in the movie Gladiator is a great big lie. Okay, it was Aurelius who made his own son co-emperor. He, he went against common Roman practice by that point. He made his own son emperor at age five, which means things were already going bad. Okay, it wasn't the golden era that everybody says it was. Because you don't make your son at age five emperor if you're not worried about succession. Okay. He, he didn't pick like everybody before him. He didn't pick some adult who was capable. He picked his own son at age five. 
Okay, but now we're looking at 179 AD, which is two years after her. Commodus is made by his dad, Marcus Aurelius, is made co-Augustus, which is a title that usually nobody gets until they've accomplished something while an emperor. That's how come Octavian became known as Augustus, because of his accomplishments after, after he became emperor, which in those days was just called Caesar. But by this time, Caesar was just heir apparent. And so for a, for a kid, because Commodus was age five when he was co-emperor, and I want to say he was like 15 at this point, to make a 15-year-old Augustus is just the height of, of nastiness to Rome. Okay, so how do you depict that in scripture to show that, yes, God foreknows this? God tags it at the end of this word, porneas. Okay, fornications. Fornication. Okay? It is. it is. It's like fornication. You're fornicating against your own country to go against its own policies of nominating as your successor somebody who's qualified. And instead you nominate your own son who's yet like 15, possibly 16. And you name him Augustus when he's not even emperor yet? I mean official. He, 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 he elevated him to that place, but, the, but the, he was a kid. He had no real duties. He had no aptitude, no nothing, and nothing. So this is, this is, this is Aurelius snubbing Rome and insulting Rome. So if that's not considered fornication, this is where we get our word pornography from. If that's not fornication, I don't know what is. And it's the very last word in the verse. And the very last, very last syllable. Because that last syllable stands for 177 AD when Aurelius did that to Commodus, elevated him like that. Okay? So then we get to the next clause, and this is where we have our first instance of the truncation. It's going to be done many times, or, or at least five times, I think, in this chapter. Akai, this is 180 AD. This is when Marcus Aurelius dies. Clear connection between him making his son co-Augustus when the kid's a teenager, just barely got the toga virilis. Okay, and he dies a year after that, a year after the end of this period, because the, the co-Augustus was in 177 right here. And as you can see, there's two more syllables after that, autis, autis. Okay. Kai is short for Kaiser. In Greek, however, Kai just means and. It's sometimes used just as a bullet point, and you don't even translate it. And a lot of these sentences begin with Kai to introduce the next point. But it's satirical, because this is when Marcus Aurelius dies. So, at Kai, Aurelius is ek. See, here's ek. Out from. Born away from. Separated from. That's what ek means. It's used as a birthing preposition equivalent to the Hebrew preposition min. Out from. When you see all those words that say in the womb, they usually um, are reverse translated. They mean out from the womb, outside the womb. Ek is equivalent of Hebrew preposition min, which really means beyond. Well, yeah, Aurelius is beyond this world if he's dead. What world he went into, well, who knows. And that's at Kai instead of Kaiser. And you say, well, Brainer, how do you know that he's doing that? Because it, that happens over and over with the death of emperors, as I'm going to show you. Okay, the next, the next sarcasm tour is the word kokikon. It means red. It's a carmine red. It's a blood, it's a tolo worm, sort of purplish red. Okay, at the end of that, 123 plus 88 is 2011 AD, and in that same year, by December, Caracalla, the son of Septimius Severus, die, um, Sever Septimius Severus dies at the end of the verse, red. So you can see the sarcasm there, okay? 
<clears throat> he dies of a blood disease. They think it was gout. Okay, he dies 2011, and within a few months, his own son, Caracalla, that was his nickname, kills Geta, the other son of Septimius Severus. That's red for you. We got the first red with Severus dying at the end of the verse. And then a few months after that, his own firstborn kills his secondborn. That's red for you. And it's really a purplish red. So, that's why I colored it in purple. You see, the satire, the satire is really pretty biting. And it's really pretty nasty. But see, these guys were <coughs> running after the whore. They were all, Severus in particular, there's a big debate that goes on to this day about how much Septimius Severus and his wife and his kids were cultivating unity of church and state. Only it wasn't church then, it was pagan Rome. They were using that in order to justify their own um, usurpation. Okay? And that's going to continue to happen through 235 AD. But this is the first instance, Caracalla in particular who had, uh, you know, he was rebaptized with a different name twice. It doesn't matter because everybody knows him as Caracalla, which just means a, a military cloak. Sort of used by the Gauls. Kills his own brother. So that's red for you. His dad dies and he kills his brother. That's about as cokey as you want to get. Because Geta, like Caracalla, were all both designated Caesars, they were both designated co-emperors with Septimius Severus. Same gambit that uh, had been followed by Marcus Aurelius, which Severus was aiming to emulate. He rebaptized his kids with names that were evocative of Marcus Aurelius. Well, that's red for you. See, this is biting. It's intentionally biting. But it goes on. Then we have here, the end of this, Okay, um, this is 218 AD. Okay, Onomata, name. Full of the names. Full of names of blasphemies, you know, in other words, the types. Names, Onomata. And what's really interesting about this is that um, Codex Sinaiticus, in one of its versions, has the Ta, and in another version, doesn't. So whether it does or not is something of a question mark. But if the ta doesn't really belong, then you would say you would pronounce this blasphemias rather than blasphemias. But if the ta is there, you have to pronounce it blasphemias. So it's a question of which title do you use because this this is not sayable in elegant Greek. Which is this is elegant Greek that John is writing. See, it's remonta. Onomata blasphemias. If there's no, if it's not onomata, it would read genom gemonta onoma blasphemias. See, you're keeping the cadence the same. Okay, and he's also tagging Ephesians. Every single one of these seventies is tagging um, a prior Bible passage. And, it's, and by doing that, it's called incorporation by reference in modern legal English. You're basically taking the, the text of that passage and you're appending it to this text to, to create a whole idea. Okay? It's very, very often used in legal language. Okay? It's called incorporation by reference. And you do that by some kind of uh, specialized addition that you add to your text that makes somebody know that you're referring to some other text and each one of these sevens is referring to other texts and I tell you what the other text is this this is referring to like practically every book in the New Testament so I didn't have room to write all that so I just picked the salient ones this is referring especially to Mark 13 2 okay although there are other other New Testament passages that I could add in there. So it's like saying, hi, you're reading this text, but once you finish reading this text, look at the other the other verses that have 91 date lines, because I'm including all of those. That's a way of proving that this is a Bible book. That kind of, like, cleverness, okay? Because how could you remember? 
okay? How could you know all this that quickly? And how could you know how this text, which is prophetical, ties to these other verses so that you're getting your syllable counts there? So see, he had to be inspired by God to do this. And that's one of your better ways of knowing, hi, this is really the word of God. We really have the real words, okay? Copied century after century by scribes who had no idea this was there. Okay? And so here he's tagging, especially Ephesians 1b, and I, you know, when you go to read it and add the text together, you see how witty it is that he's tagging it. The same thing is true here, so that's how come I know that either you count the ta and you treat this as one syllable, or you leave out the ta and you count this as two syllables. And take your pick. It's still going to be ten syllables. It's still going to total to 133. I'm 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 counting it because I'm thinking he's playing sound here. You can monta onomata. You see da 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 da. Okay, the the cadence is what makes me pick that that the one of the you know the Codex Sinaiticus is that has that tie at it. That that's what he means. Okay, but you can play it either way, and you still have the same result. Now. If the tie is there, that's when the Emperor Macrinus dies. And this was a particular trick that Paul had used on Macrinus. Okay? Every time Paul uses the word telematos in Ephesians 1, every time you get to the Eda of telematos, an emperor dies. And the first one was Trajan, and then the second one was Macrinus. And in each case, the Eda of Telematos in Ephesians 1 is reserved for the emperor's death. There's three of them. The third one is Diocletian in Ephesians. Okay, but we haven't gotten that far in, in Revelation yet, so I'm not going to cover that yet. But the point is, is that just like Paul is doing, who's being tagged, just like Paul is doing, our boy John obviously looking at Ephesians, is playing the same game. Now, what kind of game is that? Well, you have to kind of know something about the Greek. The word ta is just a definite article, and it's female or neuter. Okay? Usually to is the neuter, but I've, I've seen sometimes when it's used ta, and it's a different case then. But the point is that it's just a definite article. So Macrinus is no more than a definite article of history. No more than an asterisk in history. That's how biting this is. Okay? Now the Severan mothers win the purple back from, as a result of Macrinus dying. There were, the sister of Julia Domna had two daughters. And the two daughters win back power in Rome with the army by claiming that Caracalla had incestuous relationships with their own, with, with them. And that their two nephews, or actually their sons, but the nephew of Julia Domna, Domna great nephew, that, that those kids were actually the product of incest, which is a blasphemy in Roman culture. So how is it marked here? I didn't even, I didn't even, do that. I should do that. Blasphemias is their claim to get them in power. Okay? To get them in power. So I gotta, I gotta bold that. I gotta white the text. And then I gotta purple it. See, that's another one. Another pun. On future history. Now, did John know this when he was writing it? Did he know all these details? I don't know. But, you know what? You can't say, since all the people copying it didn't know, you can't say that this is like an invention. It's tagging too much, and it keeps going on. This is just, we're just getting started. Okay, so Macrinus is just an article in history, and then the Severan, the 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 Severan daughters of Julia um, Mesa 
who was uh, Julia Domna's sister. Julia Domna was married to Septimius Severus. This is how they get to power on a claim that the Romans consider blasphemy. And see, here's the word that's used. I mean, does it get more biting than this? All right. Now, the end here is 235 A.D. and they're all slain. Kerata Deca. Deca means ten. All right. There were at least ten people who tried to get in, you know, gain the purple. There were at least ten people. So I guess I should say should put that to they started the what historians today call the crisis of the third century um, there were at least ten of them okay and you can look them up um, you can just look up any of these guys like here oh not that one uh, let's see where is it? Aurelius there we go see that linked RomanEmperors.org you can look it up for the, the area around 235 A.D. and see how many were trying to claim the purple. So to say Deca here is another piece of satire. Alright? And modern historians call that the crisis of the 3rd century. You can just Google on that. Okay? And then you can go up here to where the Aurelius link is. And at the very bottom left of that page... There will be a return to the imperial index, and that will be a chronological index of the emperors. And you can look for the period of 235 A.D. Who were trying to be emperors after, after Alexander Severus was killed. There are at least ten of them. Okay, in a very short period. Kerata means horn. Deca means ten. So horn is a symbol of power. It's got a it's got a very old uh, common usage in the Old Testament. Horn means your prowess. Horn means your sexual ability. Horn means your political ability. Horn means rulership. Your ability to impose your will on someone else because you got a horn like an animal, so you can kill the person if they don't comply. That's the idea. Okay, and it's also got an obvious sexual connotation. I shouldn't have to explain. Okay, now this is actually 234. He's on camp. Alexander Severus is on campaign then. Severus himself dies in 235. I didn't have room to put all of it on without messing up the page. But Severus himself actually dies. Here we go, second time, just like his dad. His dad is considered, Aurelius was considered a Kai and dies. Okay, Severus gets Kokikon red for his death. All right. So now the the Severans who claim to be from Marcus Aurelius are slain by 235 A.D. and the last guy of that was Alexander Severus, and there's the Kai for him, and he really is a truncated Kaiser because his mommy was ruling him. Okay, Julia Mamea, she she, she tried to pretty much do all kinds of things to rule herself. Very bad phenomenon of history. Okay. She tried to take over. So he wasn't really a Kaiser because he was still like 16, 17, 18. He grew up a little by 235. But he was a young kid. So he's just a Kai. He's not a Kaiser. Just like Aurelius dies at Kai here. See, this is where Aurelius dies. So, this is where Alexander Severus, who was supposed to be a, you know, like reincarnation of the Aurelian dynasty, that's where he dies. See, it's a common thing, it, it, it's a recurring thing, but it doesn't stop there, okay? Kokikon, used again red, the Decius persecution. Of Christians, you could call that, you know, red. You know, the play on red. So we got to put that in there too. But you could also say the red was for the wine, because the libellus was, even if you were a Christian, 
um, you wouldn't be persecuted, have your stuff taken, and possibly be killed if you would take a, a cup of wine and pour it out on the ground. That was deemed to be an offering to the gods. Okay? So it's red either way. Kokikon. Okay? And that was the end of this verse, was the Decius persecution. And that ties to Ephesians 1.10, which I should have mentioned, but didn't. Wow, I'm seeing all these things that I didn't notice until now. That's a tag. He's tagging Ephesians 1.10 with that. Which he's also going to do down here, more explicitly. But uh, Dudesius' persecution is actually referenced in Ephesians 1.10. Okay. Okay for this same year. Okay, because 164 plus 88 164 plus 88 252, that's when the Diocletian, the Decius persecution rather pretty much ended. That's its last year. So Kokikon is three syllables. Okay, well it went on for about three years. See how clever this is? And it keeps on being clever. I mean, if it was just once or twice, you could say, oh, that's a coincidence, brain out. But you'll notice it keeps on tallying. All right? Now, there's so much to say here about Carus, the next emperor, and the rise of Diocletian, who was his adjutant, that I don't even know how to characterize this, but pretty much all of it is satirical also. But I just don't know how to, like, what's the main point that, that is being stressed and I don't know what that is yet but I don't have to know because now look at this this is such a killer Keri means hands the verse is saying that that she has in her she has in her hand a gold cup in her hands that that's um, you know, it's about how she's dressed and she's got a gold cup in her hands. It hasn't yet gotten to the next clause tells you what that cup is full of. Okay, but the stress is that she's got it in her hand. Alright, get this. When you get to when you get to this, one ninety nine this just kills me how how apt it is. One ninety nine is the meter plus eighty eight. It's two eighty seven. Okay. So, 87, 86, 85, 84, 83. The definite article is considered part of a noun. You could, it's often translated as a possessive. In her, in the hand of hers is what it literally says. But oftentimes it can also stand alone as a possessive. The point is it's not divorced from the noun. The normal form of Greek is to have the definite article and the noun together. And it's, there's a lot of reasons for that. It's not just to be extra wordy. Um, but the point is that you can consider the noun to start at the definite article. And remember we already saw here, Macrinus dies as a mere definite article. Okay, well here's another form of a definite article. Okay, but the bigger point is that at that point, that's 283 A.D., this guy Diocletian, he will end up becoming an emperor because of this particular action here. In 283 AD, he kills a guy named Aphor. Aphor was the guy who was guarding um, Numerian and Carinus, who were the sons of Carus. Apparently Numerian died and was still being carried on a litter after he died. And the guy who was in charge of protecting him was a guy named Aphor. But what you really got to know, the killer part about this that proves it's God's omniscience, is the word aphra means boar, the animal, B-O-A-R. And Diocles, long time before he ever got into the army, a gypsy gave him a prophecy that he would come to great fame and prominence and wealth when he killed a boar, a B-O-A-R, which is what aphra means. So Diocles, in the year 2283, upon the discovery of that Numerian was dead in his litter, Diocles' own hands, with his own hands, he kills Aphor. And then he claims the purple. 
and he himself personally himself dates his reign from 283 AD. Ephesians had done the same kind of accounting of him. Only instead of using hands, it uses head. Anakephaleosaste. That's in Ephesians 1.10. And at the mark for the Diocles beginning 283, this is also tying to Ephesians 1.10. But I don't know how to put all that information I just told you into this short of space here. So I'm just telling you about it. It's enough just to see that this is the word hands. It's the definite article begins the noun for all intents and purposes in the Greek. And it's Diocles' hands who kill the boar per a prophecy he got. And, you, and links to see all that stuff will be right here. All the independent books. It says 267 to 275, but it goes all the way down in time. It's just that you can't see it too well unless I started early. So if you just keep on reading in that link, you'll find the independent links that will cover the material I just told you. Because I learned it from, from independent materials on the internet that are from, you know, like scholastic sources. So you'll be able to see those sources yourself and learn it yourself. And then you'll come back here and go, oh my God. You'll notice that God is picking things that wouldn't commonly be known. You can find them. But you wouldn't they wouldn't commonly be known in history books. Alright? And, and this particular thing about him killing a boar is in a, a, a book from like 1875 that I happen to find. Okay? That's called The Persecution of Diocletian. Okay? And the book is in 1875 that I found. So it's not like you can commonly find this information, but God would know. All right? In 283 AD is when Diocletian himself dated his own reign, which is two years before the Senate actually confirmed him as emperor. Well, that's kind of important. So now look. Diocletian completes the initial tetrarchy. That's what he's known for, the tetrarchy set setup. He celebrates his ten years right here. Well, what's that word? Delugmaton. It's really important for when we get to Constantine. Okay? Delugmaton. It means abominations. So Diocletian is at the end of, end of abominations. That's God's, like, you know, what do you want to call it? Verdict on him after his ten years of rule. End of abominations. Okay? Now we get here, and now we're coming into the time of Constantine. This is 304 AD. And I think I'll pick that up next because my throat's starting to hurt, and I don't know if I'm recording. 